I'm here with Guy Madden. And Guy, thank you for being here um, for the first EFO Talks event. I really, really appreciate that. My pleasure, Jason. My pleasure. It's, um, I'm in Winnipeg with my dog, Lil. It's a heat wave right now. It's crazy, crazy hot. And I never did need an air conditioner. Now I need one badly and all the stores are sold out. Oh, anyway. man. They're, they're, wow. So uh, and the air conditioners are sold out? Is that yeah, it's certainly right. I, you know, I've never, I'm 65 years old, never planned really much in advance. You'd think I'd have an air conditioner by now. Yeah. Well, no, it's all good. Well, thank you for being here again. And I guess the best place to, to start is I just kind of want to start from the beginning. Like, I know that you're also an artist, you know, so just from the beginning, like what kind of led you to becoming a filmmaker? Yeah, the very beginning, I... I guess, I, let me, I'm going way back now. This look on my face is me just falling back in years. Um, I, I think I always, like so many nerdy little boys coming home from a James Bond movie or something, I always felt I wanted to be either in the movie as, it, as a character in its reality mm -hmm. or an actor in the movie or that someday maybe make a movie like that. Anyway, I was so suffused with the thrills of having seen a movie as a kid that I wanted a part of that, I don't know. And, um, and but living in Winnipeg during the old analog days, long, long, long before the internet connected us to the world a little bit, um, I just didn't know anyone who had ever met who made a movie or anything like that. But one day when I was 24, I was crashing um, a night class in uh, film and lit at the University of Manitoba, just for something to do. I think they had air conditioning. Um, and I went in and um, a local filmmaker I'd never heard of before, a guy named John Page showed a movie he'd made. This was uh, 1980. And he showed a movie called The Obsession of Billy Bodsky. The very uh, George Kuchar like and John Waters like, I don't think he'd seen any John Waters or Kuchar brother movies, but <clears throat> by coincidence, he'd arrived at the same sort of low budget, no actor kind of spirit, but the damn it, the movie looked great. And he was really in love with old Technicolor and he was able to get his movie to look like super saturated Technicolor. And um, in spite of the actors not having any experience and him not having any budget, the movie was really entertaining. It was half an hour long. And I remember just going straight up to him afterwards and, and asking him, how much did that movie cost you to make? <laughs> I was such a boor. And he just said $5,000, which would be like $20,000 now or something. And I just thought to myself, I'm going to get $5,000 and make a movie. And it was right there because it is something I'd been dreaming about my whole life. And, that, and then when I suddenly had an example right in front of me of someone who turns out lived a block away from me, um, making this really exciting thing. It was very underground. And that excited me even more because I thought, well, I'll never be as skillful as a Hollywood filmmaker, but you can make a really entertaining thing that's underground and rough around the edges, but still exciting. And then shortly after I saw uh, Luis Bunuel's uh, Lage d'Or, which is the same idea in many ways, um, inexperienced actors, except for the male lead, Gusto Mado, and just great ideas. And um, I think he had a bigger budget by dint of some French aristocrats giving him their mansion to work in and all the participants in his film were wealthy, either bourgeoisie or uh, artists and stuff like that. But that too is really exciting to me. And I just thought you don't need to have that Hollywood polish to make something that's really exciting. As a matter of fact, I already decided I don't want Hollywood polish. I just want to make these things exciting. And then the third thing I saw, which just clinched it, these are all film experiences in very short order, like within a week of each other, was I saw David Lynch's The Racer Head. And, and that movie, which so many people are saying it's crazy, it's not about anything, it's just a nightmare. But um, I had recently become a father in, a, in an unplanned pregnancy and I was um, just divorced 
after 15 months of marriage from the mother of my unplanned child, my daughter, who's 43 years old now and beautiful, the most important person in my life. But the uncomfortable nightmare, just the strange um, um, murky lostness that the main character played by Jack Nance in that movie just spoke to, that was me just a year earlier when the baby was born. That was me just being so confused and lost. And I couldn't believe that someone out there had made such a highly personal film about a very specific situation, being the father in, an un, in a marriage uh, involving an unplanned pregnancy. And I, it was just, um, it is what the film's about. It's about many other things too, but it just- Although, all, although it, Lynch yeah, claims yeah. He, he doesn't really say what it's about, but I think that's the point of the film. He wants to keep people talking because it's kind of like poetry a song or a poem means something to somebody else than it may mean to you. Exactly. Yeah. And so these three viewing experiences, I was so lucky that I, I was visited with this constellation of a local filmmaker, um, then a filmmaker from 1930, and then a filmmaker that was, you know, making stuff fresh, fresh out of the lab. Um, and all of the, and they were about something, they were makeable, they seemed, you know, very doable. They seemed like they were fun and they were profoundly about things in ways that I, so, you know, in a word, I knew I would never have to write a script that involved a lot of research. Uh, I could just do all the research I needed right here in my heart or in my unreliable memory and just try to get some feelings on screen. And so I've been trying to do that ever since. I don't know if I've succeeded, but I've just tried to take feelings, feelings that it's usually the job of literature to get out and on the page. Uh, rather than it's harder for films, I think. But I just thought I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make, um, like you say, something like poetry that's honest, because um, mm -hmm. it's gonna be artsy fartsy, and I'll be accused of wanking. So I thought my best defense against that was to always make films um, that were honest and important to me, and um, and then maybe that honesty would show through eventually somehow. And that first film you made that was was that the Dead Father. That's right. Yeah, my father had died just a few years earlier, but he kept returning to me in my dreams every night. And um, and I tried convincing in my dreams he had never died. He had abandoned us and gone to live with another family, a better family. And in so in this dream, every night I had about a minute to convince him that his original family, us, were worth sticking around for, but I always failed. But I, I could remember, so even as I had these dreams, he died in 1977. So even as the years advanced, I could remember his voice perfectly, but only in dreams. So it always felt when I woke up that I'd been freshly abandoned by him, but also that I had just freshly spoken to him. And uh, it was a really beautiful feeling uh, that the having just been with him recently, uh, somehow it trumped um, being abandoned by him recently. <laughs> and um, I really wanted to try to get that feeling on the screen. I think I failed completely, but it was worth the effort. Well, you did, know, you, did you find it cathartic to try and do that though, to kind of express that out there? I guess I was basically just taking the strategies that David Lynch was using in Eraserhead to take a literal experience. He had a baby in, in real life. It was very beautiful and cute and grew up to be, you know, um, Jennifer Lynch, uh, but um, in in the movie, uh, it was something that sort of could hold all the discomfort, the, all the body horror discomfort he felt about everything, and uh, the nightmarish queasiness and off balance um, nature of his life, and just put it all in one skinned sheep or whatever that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I just thought I would try to do something like that. And then, and then there's lots of gags in it. And I thought, yeah, if, if, if someone thinks my movie's try, trying to be too serious, really wanking too hard, I'll just put some stupid gags in, you know? And I'm, I'm, I still am not happy unless there's a stupid gag in the movie <laughs> fairly frequently, you know? Yeah. Even if you laugh at it. <clears throat> <laughs> well, did, did it, doing that film help bring some, any type of closure to you in that process or? It's strange. No, I, I still kept, thank God, I didn't really want closure. I loved those dreams. And I still kept dreaming reg, fairly regularly about my father for 
a couple decades after. I know, I know I had some people telling me that you really got to bring these dreams to an end. It's not healthy. But I didn't care if they were unhealthy. I, they brought me great comfort. And they're finally gone now. Um, and I discovered it, one of my favorite writers, the Polish writer Bruno Schultz, who was writing Between the Wars, he, he too wrote Dead Father short stories. And um, in, the final, in the final visit of his father, his father came back as a crab. And then the, um, someone in the household accidentally cooked it up. And then they put the, this, bake, this boiled crab that was his father on the dinner table. And someone forgot it was his father and ate some of it. And then the, the next morning, the crab had escaped. It had left a leg or two behind in some congealed aspic and made an escape. So I, I gobbled up everything by Bruno Schultz because I realized this guy was writing about things and at a level of surrealism that was really something I felt should be filmed. And, um, and I've, I've seen movie adaptations of Bruno Schultz and um, it's tough to get, get it, but it just gave me courage to proceed. And so a lot of times I'll make a movie, um, you asked me if it was cathartic, in that case it wasn't because it was such a big, well, it felt good to make it, but it didn't supply closure. I don't think it was closure, but I have made movies about obsessions uh, of mine before. And just the sheer act of making, especially a large movie where it takes you a year, a year and a half to make it, and you've got to take an obsession of yours, say an early childhood memory and experience, and you've got to write it down. Then you've got to cast it and find locations for it or make props for it, costumes. You've got to shoot it. You've got to edit it. Then you've got to score it. And then you've got to show it at a festival and you get to do, you don't have to, if you're lucky, you do. Uh, you uh, get to answer Q and A's about it. You try to promote the movie and, um, eventually the movie you made replaces your obsession, replaces your memories. And you can't really remember your original memories over which you're obsessing and you just remember the movie. And, the, and everyone in your childhood is replaced by the actors you managed to find in the last year. And then it's just finally a form of aversion therapy. You finally just get so sick of, of the movie and, and the disappointments because every movie is an inventory of disappointments as much as accomplishments. And so you finally just get sick of it and you do, you can cure yourself of certain obsessions, whether you want to be cured or not, um, by making a movie about them. So I have had closure in most cases when I've chosen a very personal subject. Well, and that seems to be a theme in a lot of your films, because I, there's been, there's certain films where you, there is a young guy mad. Like, I know the film that really got, when I first heard of you, was Brand Upon the Brain. I was right. just out of high school, going into film, and um, I heard about Brand Upon the Brain, and what fascinated me was I saw that it was a feature-length silent film, yeah. and but it had live orchestra and fully work, and sometimes narration, if I remember correctly. And mm -hmm. that fascinated me because to me, it was a melding of different things with a film. It, it became more of an experience rather than just watching a movie. It really was. I'm, I, and I became kind of a showman making that. I remember thinking, maybe even before I became a filmmaker, I thought, wouldn't it be great if someone made a silent movie now, a Super 8 silent movie? That would just be so un, um, un entrepreneurial. <laughs> 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 commercial and then I ended up making a number of silent fe uh, features and um, without even thinking but I did I remember thinking while shooting brand upon the brain I was already thinking I'm not it's not the mime isn't quite selling everything yet I'm going to need to add sound effects and then I'm going to really need to add super swollen dark music mm -hmm. here because I'm not I'm kind of rushing through the shooting day and it's going to really need some weight that isn't there Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I just started thinking, well, um, while I was shooting, I mean, it must have been on day one or two of a, an eight day shoot or whatever it was. And um, thinking, um, I'm making a silent feature. No one's going to want to watch that at a film festival. I got to I got to have live music. I got to have um, live Foley. That's a great idea. And then I had a, a and then I added 
uh, late in the editing process, I got my cinematographer who lived in Seattle. The movie is shot in Seattle, my mm -hmm. first film. Um, I got him to shoot um, a couple of songs. And um, uh, just because I just didn't want to get on a plane just to shoot. And I added just the way 1929 movies, goat glanded, they, they, call, they were called goat glands. The way people used to, people with um, erectile dysfunction would have a goat or a monkey gland. Uh, transplanted into uh, into themselves to add, give them strength and potency. Um, um, silent films often had um, a musical number or two added uh, a year after shooting was done. So I thought, oh great, I'll make a goat gland as well. I'll, I'll add I'll add a music number to it. So it has that, and it's sung by um, it's voiced in person by a castrato uh, that I knew from Winnipeg, the Manitoba Meadowlark. Mm -hmm. uh, Davul, whom I found in a steam bath here. And um, he's the only one that's been to all the shows actually. And um, cause it really traveled all over the place. And I really did feel like a showman. I couldn't go anymore because we were really disorganized. We didn't have a proper stage manager and we were halfway through a 15 show run in, in the Lower East Side in New York with Lou Reed narrating. Um, and I was on my way to the theater and Lou Reed had shown no interest in doing this properly. And, um, and sh on the way to the theater, I was clenching my jaw without realizing and I shattered a molar. Oh. And uh, uh, so I just turned around, went back to my hotel room and phoned the theater and said, I can't make it tonight. And Lou Reed performed and he apparently fell asleep while narrating. Oh and, and <laughs> when, uh, at this at this theater on um, I think it was I can't remember it's it's the old Yiddish theater on the Lower East Side um, the loge up in which we tucked all our narrators we had different narrators Eli Wallach John Ashbury oh, that's awesome. uh, cool people it was so exciting every night just so mole shatteringly exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was up there and, he, and, he, and the only way he could get up and get down was by a ladder put in the orchestra pit but the orchestra was busy playing for the entire movie so no one could go up there and wake him up and uh, so he just snored into the microphone I think the soundboard mixer turned off his microphone but, um, so, <laughs> oh man show up in the, but I, I think that had I been there I would have I would have told him to turn up the snoring you know <laughs> Got to go with it. When when B. Lou Reed falls asleep on you, you know, you're like you're not going to pretend. Not going to pretend it didn't happen. You got to be, you know, you got to be thrilled. Yeah. Well, and it's the one film that I'm still searching for. I've been slowly collecting a lot of your films. Slowly. Right. That's the one I'm still trying to find a nice copy of. The um, Criterion Collection had had it out on DVD for a while, but not in HD, not in Blu-ray. Yeah. And, and we're trying to, there's some rights issues. We're trying to get it out on Blu-ray and Criterion Collection is very supportive of me and we'll get it out. I'd love to mount it, the live version again someday because oh, be great. the difference between just, you know, I'm proud enough of it as a DVD, but the live, the, just the live Foley artists, there are three Foley artists in white lab coats that just performed just beneath the screen and over to the right on the stage. And then the narrator was at the left. And then the, the singer would come out from behind a curtain twice during the movie. And it was real boredom insurance. But it, actually, Foley artists are fascinating to watch because they oh, insist yeah. on not using, they use doors for door slams. But other than that, they insist on using something other than what they're visually representing. You know, for instance, if there's someone biting into a neck, they, uh, well, they, they went for celery because the, the bright green of the celery and it got its own light and they really munched into it. And for, I'm trying to think of some of the other things they use for walking in snow, for instance, they use, I think it's, um, uh, they use something really squeaky that like a bag full of uh, mice or something that they squeeze together with something. <laughs> they, they have a real sense of showmanship. Oh yeah, this is over. Like, you know, I remember when I was a house painter, I used to walk around and the whole world was either houses that had been painted well or houses that needed painting badly or houses that would take a lot of scraping. And 
that's that was the world I had, was left to look at because of my job. And but Foley artists just they spend all their time uh, gliding through the world, just thinking of of sounds that they could make with things that would sound like other things. And uh, I don't know, it's it's just a great state of mind I found. And so when you when you're with Foley artists a lot, you just start looking at the world that way, and you and you start throwing out suggestions and everyone's keen to hear what one thing sounds like when rubbed or hit against another thing. It's a kind of, a, it's a weird job. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a unique, um, cause I've had to do Foley work for some of my, um, even my web series I did years ago. And there's um, video like it's of me and my brother behind the scenes, actually in that series right there, oh. where somebody gets hit with a pan. But the pan was actually just made of like styrofoam. So we had to sit there and time it just right. And we ended up mixing both pan hits together with a pillow, which didn't seem like it would make sense. But whenever you put it together in the editing, it made sense. So fo Foley artists, I have a lot of respect for because that is a very unique art form. Uh, yeah, you pointed out that thing. They're often aware that a uh, sound, and you're not allowed to use the N word for them, which is noise. Um, uh, they, um, if you describe a sound as a noise, they 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 bristle, not with the profound injury uh, uh, that the yeah. other is, but um, but they have learned that sounds are often compounds of many other sounds at uh, once, and that's what you chanced upon with your pillow solution. It's yeah. Really yeah, it's, and it was interesting too. And it's, you know, you would think too, it's also in that series, we had to do like somebody's head getting hit on a pipe. And it took me like three weeks to find the right sound because it just in the mixing and stuff. So, it, yeah, it's definitely its own art form. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about your film style because all of your films have a unique style. I mean, of course, we talked about silent film, which is what you've played a lot in, but you also have other films that obviously have you know, sound to them. Uh, yeah. What is it that makes you, that made you choose that style of filmmaking, kind of that hearkening back to the old yeah. films and stuff? It kind of just, it's it's funny. I, I wasn't a big fan of silent films when I started making, I'd seen a few. I'd seen Foolish Wives by Eric von Stroheim a number of times and Flash Door is mostly silent. Um, Eraserhead has huge silent stretches, but I wasn't a silent movie buff. And given a choice, I'd much rather watch a talking picture than a silent film most times. Um, but I went with black and white film for my first film. It was slightly cheaper than color, but it wasn't there that you save the money in the purchase of the film stock. It's, I didn't know how to control the palette of a color film. I knew from watching, uh, um, don't Look Now, Nicholas Riggs film where the color red is really important. There's a little girl in a red raincoat and whenever red shows up, it's like a five alarm fire for your all six of your senses. Mm -hmm. And um, I just didn't want a color like Don't Look Now's red to sneak into my movie and take on an accidental meaning. I just didn't know how to control palettes. When I was a house painter, I just let people pick their own house colors, of course. So I just didn't have much confidence. So I thought, well, black and white film will just turn all colors into something gray and I can control it. And then I, I uh, right at the very beginning, I just read a book on how to make a basic three light uh, set lighting setup. Um, you know, a key light, a fill light and a backlight. Mm -hmm. um, the first day of shooting, I plugged three lights in and my actor just had three nose shadows. I was so terrible at setting up the lights. So I unplugged one, got it down to two nose shadows, unplugged another, got it down to one nose shadow, but it was really dark black nose shadow that looked like a Hitler mustache. And so I got him to raise his head until the Hitler mustache shortened itself and disappeared. And there were other neat shadows that sort of created a bone structure shadow. Mm -hmm play upon his face and when I got the film back from the lab there was a kind of a German expressionist look and feel to it even though it was 
it was set in the mid 80s in Winnipeg. It looked German expressionist because uh, there is one light. So the um, subject in the middle of the frame tend to be lit and everything else graded off into shadowy vagueness. Yeah. And all of a sudden I had atmosphere where I, where I hadn't even thought of having atmosphere. I had not put one thought into it. And, and then I noticed by during editing that if I added certain types of music, sort of darker, heavier music, that that Wagner or something from an old movie, that it welded itself to the image mm -hmm. better, but just, or even somehow alchemically welded yeah. itself to the image, you know, bonded yeah. somehow, created a new element. You know, it actually suddenly seemed like a movie made by someone else. And um, so I just stuck with that. And I probably should have then gone to film school or something um, and learned how to do the three light setup properly. But instead, I just kept going at what I had chanced upon and what I was half-assed at. And I just kept working in that direction. Yeah. I started watching more silent films. I noticed that silent film stories were a couple of giant steps away from regular talking picture stories and towards fairy tales. And so I started reading more fairy tales. I started reading 19th century uh, German literature, but translated into English. And, and that sort of felt like the silent film too. And I just realized that, that the feelings I was trying to get up on the screen were kind of timeless, psychological, true, true feelings that everybody uh, has in one form or another anyway. And so I thought, well, why not have fairy tale elements in my movie, in my style? And so I kind of arrived at something that reminded a lot of people of silent films without necessarily being silent. Cause I, my very first film did have some narration. Yes. And, and my next three had even increasing amounts of dialogue. And then I made Twilight of the Ice Nymphs, my fourth film, which was full color and a, too much dialogue for my French distributor to subtitle even. And I was still getting, I was still, uh, Twilight of the Ice Nymphs, I was still getting um, reviewers saying that the film was silent film. I don't know if they had the volume turned off to their TVs or something, or or there was just something in the story, something 19th century English translation style in the story or in the way I um, arranged all my actors as if they were huddled in a tableau beneath a proscenium arch. It reminded them of, and, and maybe uh, by the time they'd sat on the film for a day or so, all dialogue disappeared from their oral memory and was replaced by intertitles of the dialogue. So I don't know, I don't know what went on in their heads. Cause you know, I remember thinking, God, I got to cut down on the amount of dialogue in my next film. You know, it's too much. Yeah. Well, and that was, um, and going back real quick, when you were talking about the lighting you did, was that for Tales of Gimli Hospital? Yeah. And, and even a, a bit in the dead father, I was learning as I went with the dead father, some of it looked better and more expressionist to me than others. But Gimli Hospital was very much expressionist and only one light. And then I remember asking George Tolles, who was my best friend and sort of a conciliary um, for me in those days. He helped out with script suggestions and things at the beginning before becoming my full-blown screenwriting collaborator. And he's never claimed to be a visual, uh, visually acute person, but he did say that for my next film, I should consider using more than one light because just a, a single uh, brightly or even overexposed face floating in blackness would, could get pretty tiresome if I shot all my films that way. So I did get someone to help me with lighting, someone who knew that for my next films, Archangel and Careful and yeah. I was able to basically just two helpers um, on, in the camera department. And uh, it really felt good to be really lean that way. Well, that's cool. Well, and so it's kind of like you happened upon your style almost, and you just kind of built on it from there and kept doing that. Because, yeah, I mean, there are German expressionistic feelings to it. But even with Twilight of the Ice Nymphs, even though it visually kind of seems like a colorized yeah. silent film, you know, um, it's, you know, you're... And I, I love old film. So that's one of the things that always fascinated me about your films. And that's what always entranced me was like, 
he is making these films look really old. And like, I always kind of felt like I'm a filmmaker at a time because I felt like I want to make these old school yeah. things. And so that always, always spoke to me. And so there is a documentary I watched um, about the making of Twilight of the Ice, Ice Nymphs. And, right. you know, I, when you were doing the opening credits, there's this great shot of you guys like almost panning down what looks like a little garden type thing that you made. We made a garden with everyone's names in stone embedded yeah. in this moss. And it, I think it was supposed to be maybe a cross section of, I can't remember if we were going down into the dark earth. I think or, that's what it was. Yeah, something I can't remember. So did you just come up with that idea or did you say, did you look at like how they used to do old school titles and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I really wanted special titles. I'd always just done the titles myself and I have, a, I'm no calligrapher. Well, I'd gotten friends to do it, but it was, it was hard. To, I hadn't met the right collaborators yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had okay titles, but even... Now I, I love my one of my directing partners, Galen Johnson, who's one of the great graphic artists uh, out there. And um, I'm really proud of the titles, you know, like the titles you did for The Forbidden Room are incredible. Yes, I absolutely, because I remember asking you about that because I was fascinated with how he visually mixed it. And then I love how the sound matched the change of everything. That was just like- He's my sound designer as well as my, um, well, a co-director, but he's also a production designer and the graphic designer on the film. So <laughs> that whole thing. he's sort of like Saul Bass uh, and uh, Bernard Herman rolled into one or something like that. You know, it's pretty great. Um, uh, but oh, they're great. Just me and I, I decided I really wanted some nice titles that like were one continuous shot of a of a three dimensional object that contained all the credits. Mm -hmm. that I wanted. But as it turned out, we um, the lead actor uh, demanded to have his name removed from the movie, <laughs> and oh, so wow. I, had to have an, I had to have an edit in the middle of that single continuous take through the credits. I had to cut out this dude's name and um, his because we'd replaced his voice, and uh, we just used the one actor I've never sort of gotten along with. Oh. Uh, just yeah. Uh, there are all sorts of theories on why he was hard to get along with. I'm an asshole, it's one of them. But um, he, um, he seemed really insecure, but refused to admit it. And um, I don't know, he just didn't get into the spirit of the movies. And whenever I tried to sh get him into the spirit of the film by showing him excerpts from my previous films, he refused, that sort of thing, you know? Oh, wow. That's I, uh, yeah, it was horrible. But, um, so... Um, do you find that, because even going into films like My Winnipeg, I absolutely love My Winnipeg, um, it also, again, you had that personal imprint because you're, you took the documentary and literally made it like you were traveling through your, your, your memories on this yeah. train, which I just absolutely love that visual because like when I heard you were doing a documentary, I was like, I've got to see this. <laughs> um because i uh because i was like he's gonna do something completely that nobody's gonna be thinking of and that's what i was excited about because i like that type of experimenting and doing different things so when doing when you were so what how did my winnipeg come about i guess let's just start yeah. there. i'd heard i was unemployed as usual and broke as usual but i'd heard a rumor that um the president of this network up here in Canada called the Documentary Channel, which had commissioned me to make a short film called My Dad is 100 Years Old uh, with Isabella Rossellini about Roberto Rossellini's centennial. So I'd made this short for the Documentary Channel, but I heard a rumor that he was interested in asking me to shoot a feature length documentary. And I just, once I heard that rumor, I really wanted to do it. And I was thinking, what am I supposed to do? Just wait around for him to phone? That Maybe he'll never phone. It could be a year, so I just phoned him and said, I heard a rumor you're interested in hiring me to do a feature length documentary, any truth to it? And he said, uh, yes, come to think of it, I am. What do you wanna do a documentary on? And I said, I don't know, I have no idea. I've never done a documentary before. And, um, 
and I said, can you assign me a documentary? And he said, um, well, he said he'd worked on Terrence Malick's Days of Heaven in Alberta. And he said, you do a documentary about, a, about the trains that roll out of Winnipeg to Alberta and sort of recreate my trip to work on Days of Heaven in 1975 or whenever that was. Um, or you can just do a documentary on the city of Winnipeg. I just thought, oh my God, yes, Winnipeg. I'd been trying to mythologize Winnipeg in films for quite a while anyway, including Saddest Music in the World. I'd long figured out that the mythologizing element or medium um, of the last hundred years was film emulsion and video. And um, that once something is consecrated to film, it just becomes a little more true, even if it's a lie. And uh, so I jumped at the chance and, he, and then he, he just said, okay, just, just write, write an outline of what you're gonna do and we'll, we'll make this thing. And a couple days later, I went, I, I happened to be in Paris, got a city name dropping, but someone, I, I was showing Saddest Music in the World, which is, you know, kind of a crazy movie. And someone in the Paris audience asked, what's Winnipeg like? Is there something like, is it that weird? Is it, <laughs> is it um, like, is there something in the drinking water? You know, that sort of thing, you know, is that <laughs> like? And I just gave a really long answer. You know, I, I, I tend to give long answers. Even here tonight, I'm giving pretty long answers. But I gave about a 20-minute long answer where I just started making up crap about Winnipeg. Um, you know, about how um, in Winnipeg, um, you know, it has, I think I said it has like 40 times the sleepwalking rate of any other city. And as a matter of fact, um, if a sleepwalker comes uh, to his old address, and has his old key on him, you got to allow him to come in and, and sleep until he wakes up in the morning, then you, then you can let him out, you know, that sort of thing. I was just making up stuff. Um, and at the end of 20 minutes, I realized I had the complete outline of the movie. And um, I just went back to the hotel room and wrote an email uh, as much as I could remember from my um, monologue of, of crap. And, um, and the guy just green lit it the next day. That's he, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was so great. I didn't want to narrate it myself, but the one condition was he said, there's so much falseness in this documentary that the one thing is you got to narrate it yourself. And I was, ah, damn, you know, I wanted to get James Mason revived, exhumed and revived somehow to narrate this thing <laughs> that much. But I thought a lot about lying and it, you know, and lying, I, I won't make flippant fun of it because, you know, fake news and the kind of lies Donald Trump told over the last um, 70 years uh, have become a, a point of, you know, a point of extreme um, pain for a lot of Americans, I know, for the whole world. So I won't be flippant about lying and how much fun it was or anything, but it's, there's a certain kind of lying. I when I traveled with that movie and I narrated it live, like an old travelogue, I was sort of hooked on the showmanship from Brand Upon the Brain. So I traveled around with um, my Winnipeg to you know, like Israel and Australia and Buenos Aires and things, you know, all over. I got to travel a lot, and narrate it. And you could really put some extra mustard on the narration of the movie live that wasn't there in the recorded version. Um, you could sort of gauge your audience and see if they were drifting away and you could, you know, sort of pepper up certain things. I liked, I liked performing and, uh, and I'd always been painfully shy, but I loved, I liked performing. So I agreed that I would narrate it. And I even learned to grudgingly like my voice. Okay. During the mixing, which was agony. Cause I, I was one of those people that couldn't stand listening to his own voice, but I, I learned to accept it. It, it did get some bad reviews, my voice. You know, there are people who called it woefully inadequate and stuff like that, but it was a condition. You but know, I, thought about, I thought about all the lying I do. Sorry, ask what oh, you no. have. Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say, but I think having you narrate it is what brought me into it because yeah. I felt like I was being told a true story that was also a, also, while simultaneously being told a fairy tale. Yeah, yeah. And having you telling me that as I'm watching it is what kind of got me into it. Um, I think that guy was right. The, Michael Burns, his name was the director of the, the documentary channel, which was instantly killed after my Winnipeg was made. 
Um, so he was he was right that that it was necessary. Um, I I made it a point during the Q and A, you know, because a lot of times the Q and A was just people saying, "Is this true or is that true?" Were there really the did the bunch of horses really freeze in the Red River, you know, that sort of thing. And I was going to ask you about that because I was kind of curious how you came up with that. <laughs> well, I just, I made a point of just answering. I tried to keep track of my answers and I would um, admit if something was untrue on one occasion, but I would keep track and remember that the next time I was asked about it, I would ex go the exact opposite and double down on the lie. And um, I remember being in Reykjavik and the lights went up and there was a QA and a and and a woman put up her hand and started asking in that soft Icelandic voice of hers, is it true about the horse heads? And it was Bjork. Bjork was asking me a question, is it true? And while she was asking me this question, which was a little longer than that, I, um, I was thinking, Bjork, I can't lie to Bjork. And then, no, I must lie more to Bjork. And, uh, and so I just, I even just improvised some nonsense about how the, yes, the horse had stayed there all winter and people visited them so much that even on the warmer days of winter, sitting on them really wore the fur off their noses and they got quite grisly, but we were lucky that the, the footage we do have of them is when they're, you know, taken recently after they're freezing in place and all that stuff or whatever. And, you know, they asked me out for um, lunch. Uh, we had uh, some whale skewers for lunch in Reykjavik and I was, I was thrilled that I'd lied to Bjork. I, I've since come to admonish myself for lying so much because of course, like I said, in the Trump years, lying became something that was pretty infuriating to everyone because everyone's just fact checking this guy, motherfucker. And uh, anyway, um, and, and he's just going on anyway, you know, but um, I decided that there's a moment, there's something very revealing about how you choose to lie. When you're asked a question in that moment, you're trying to think of a lie to tell. There's a kind of a lie curation that goes on. You try one and you go, nah, that one's too far-fetched. That one's too silly. This one, ah, that one is just right. And there's something about the lies you choose to tell that are just as revealing as if you told the truth, maybe even more so. They kind of, they kind of reveal what you want, wish things were. And in a way, that's just as revealing as things that happen to be, you know, as facts. Uh, so I think I might as all those years that I toured around with that movie and, and lied to everybody, I might as well have just been standing there with my pants around my ankles on sodium pentothal telling the truth to everyone. So because the lies amounted to exactly the same thing. Yeah, but I think as a filmmaker and a storyteller, though, I think there's a big difference between myth you like how would you say like mythologizing winnipeg versus somebody who's you know making the decisions of a country you yes. know <laughs> you know so about that stuff yeah or you know uh or about the sexual assaults you've committed and things like that uh, yeah uh, making light of that stuff um, and then, of course, there's always the inspiration of Werner Herzog, who it, no one even cares if he's telling the truth or not. He's just such a fabulous myth. -killer. Work is also considered experimental yeah um because of quarantine here in the united states when it happened i dove into experimental film head first and i actually started with eraser head i bought it on criterion brought it home and i dove in and then it was just down the rabbit hole from there i went back and started revisiting a lot of your films and then i got to stan brackage maya darren and i just kept going and I discovered the subgenre of uh, cinematic poetry, which people take their poems and visually either tell a story or like, just put images or video over what the poem is. But I wanted to actually tell stories in doing that. So 
is there a subgenre in the experimental field that has kind of caught your interest? Yeah, there have been a few over the years. It's kind of strange. Uh, the film critic, uh, he's independent now, but he was a longtime Village Voice dude, um, Jay Hoberman, once described me as um, either the most experimental mainstream filmmaker or the most mainstream experimental filmmaker. <laughs> because this part of me just wanted to entertain people yeah. you know, and tell stories. And another part of me really was intoxicated by uh, experimental literature and experimental films. I really fell in love with um, repurposed footage films or found footage films, you know, the work of Matthias Muller, Christoph Gierde. They made the tapes around the centennial of Alfred Hitchcock, a movie called Home Stories, which is great. Um, then there's Martin Arnold, um, um, Alone, Lifeway, Sandy Hardy, just where the footage is repurposed. Um, he did um, uh, re deanimated, um, where he took the, the Bella Lugosi crime thriller, The Invisible Ghost, and slowly removed all the characters from it until the camera's just traveling up and down the empty corridors of a house. Um, I like, I kind of like that stuff. And then we got to make our film, Galen and Evan and I made our film, The Green Fog, which is our remake of Vertigo, using footage exclusively from movies shot in the Bay Area. Yeah. And, um, and since Vertigo is about a guy who's in love with a woman and then he remakes her, he sort of gentrifies her. And it was really the perfect movie to, to remake in that way uh, out of, you know, out of air sats material and create something. And in the case of Vertigo, uh, of course, Madeline Elster was never there. Uh, Kim Novak was, uh, or Judy Barton as played by Kim Novak was playing Madeline Elster as a, fra a fake Madeline Elster. And then she had to pretend to be, um, um, her on top of it. So it was, in a way, uh, the movie The Green Fog is taking a bunch of material just that just happens to be lying around the Bay Area in a bunch, in a hundred different movies and recreates in a kind of um, um, an artificial vertigo. And vertigo, it's as if vertigo wasn't really there either. You yeah. know, it's like film material. So have you, have you seen any Craig Baldwin's films? Yeah, I, I really like those films and uh, just all all the, I, I, I just love watching what editing does, what changing the edit, what the Kuleshev effect is, you know, like where, you know, the, the famous Kuleshev experiment where Lev Kuleshev in the Soviet Union took a shot of, I'm blanking on that actor's name now, but uh, a Soviet movie star of the, of the day and had a very ambiguous facial expression uh, on his face and then cut in um, a bowl of steaming soup. And everyone was asked what the expression on the actor's face was and it was hunger. And then removed the bowl of soup and cut in a reclining voluptuous woman and lust was perceived on this very same shot of the very same face. And then a dead child in a coffin was the third shot swapped in for the voluptuous woman. And that this ambiguous facial expression was read as grief by everybody. And so the Kuleshev experiment can be expanded well beyond just a single cut. When you start, when you start changing the context of, of stories and um, when you start changing the music that's accompanying images, you start changing the, um, the character's relationships to each, I don't know, there's just so many variables once, once you start taking apart a movie and reassembling it. Yeah. Uh, it's like an orgy of Kuleshev effects. And that really excites me. And you really, um, making, making these repurposed footage films teaches you so much about how film works. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not, I'll never be an academic, but I almost feel I could teach academically, you know, how film, you know, like how film works because of, these experiences of not just simply editing the footage you wrote and shot yourself, but taking the footage of other people and yeah. repurposing it is really, really educational. And educational doesn't sound very exciting. Really illumin like exciting, astonishingly illuminating, you know, put it that way. 
Yeah, well, and that's the same thing I tell, like when, I, when I've when i taught adjunct, I've always actually showed my students older films Yeah. to show them how your guys are still doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, but think about how they did, and I, and I compare a cut from, you know, Haxon to another film that's more recent. And I try to show them that the old style of film, you're still, it's, we're, we're just more digital. And we yeah. have a few little bells and whistles, but we're still doing what these guys were doing. It's just that they were figuring it out. <laughs> how yeah, to the do it. area is all in place pretty much with that unfortunate uh, birth of a nation. But, you know, right around around then and, and also in Italy around the same time as Birth of a Nation, there are all these feature length films coming around just before World War II that were sort of mastering the vocabulary that we're still using now. Then there's the real, you know, Kurosawa is like the master of formal editing and shooting and stuff like that. But Eisenstein did pretty good, too, though. What's that? Sorry. Eisenstein. But with. Um... No, and his is totally different and really exciting, mm -hmm. uh, you know moves the camera so rarely so it's just pure montage and then i i kind of like that crazy ass um french cokehead abel Gant, the guy who made um you know the napoleon biopic in 1927 it's just so megalomaniacal and his editing he doesn't even care about continuity of time or space he'll just cross cut between night and day and in micro montage and and across great um you know, many time zones of geography and, uh, but his editing is really exciting. And it's, I remember watching one of his movies, I think it was La Rue, The Wheel, the train melodrama with a friend. And he just said, wow, this is like, almost like where editing could have gone if this film was just more of a hit. Like it's just like, in, but instead this other editing vocabulary that we're all used to now and that kids can watch, but it would have been the lingua franca Franca, uh, uh, whatever. Why did I use that expression when I don't know how to say it? It would have been the common, the common vocabulary of yeah. Austin, had it just been a bigger hit, yeah, time, or it could have been, you know, put it that way. And um, so it's these things excited me that there were all these, you know, in the industrial haste of filmmaking, because film has always been an industry before an art form. Um, so a lot of perfectly uh, good. Never, not quite yet ex fully exploited conventions were discarded in industrial haste. And it was exciting to me when I went back and started watching older movies to see that there was still plenty of stuff that, you know, just discarded on the highway of film history, you know, old tires that still had lots of miles on them and mm -hmm. old engine parts that still worked and just need to be shone up a little bit. So um, and then, of course, you're watching those movies with the knowledge that they were made by um, in Hollywood by um, a, a super racist, sexist uh, money machine that, um, you know, basically segregated white and black Americans and left blacks out except for some butler roles and, and the rare exception. Um, there are some great women's pictures, maybe. But you know, there's tons of sexist convention. I, you know, I'm not here to give a lecture on film history, but I think there were some great women's pictures made by, you know, starring Joan Crawford and Betty Davis and Olivia de Havilland and stuff that probably represented strong roles, every bit as strong for their female leads as any films that are being made now. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a shame that for all the progress Hollywood um, boast that it's making since, you know, Oscar's so white and, and stuff like that, that, that it's, that it hasn't really made such great strides in, in women's film. Not yet. It's, it's showing big signs, you know, it is. Yeah, no, I agree. We're all yeah. just better off for it. If everyone, everyone was just represented. I'm white male. Do I really need to hear my own voice over and over again all the time? You know? Uh, the feedback loop inside my head is already driving me crazy. So I'm, I'm excited. My new favorite film of all time, as a matter of fact, is Wanda by Barbara Loden, an inexpensive independent film made in 1970. She wrote it, starred in it, directed it. And it's, 
it's so great. I, I can't even allow myself to daydream that I could have made it, but it's made at such a small budget that it almost feels like I, I could have made it had I been a really brilliant actress, uh, like a really, a really brilliant woman in 1970 or something like that. I don't know. It's, there's a way into it that yeah. involves my narcissism. But then, I, but then I just have to stand back in awe of it. And, yeah. um, and so, um, I don't know, more of that, I say. You know, it's really eccentric and beautiful. And uh, uh, it, it reminds me of some of my favorite women writers. And um, um, I don't know, just more of that. I would just wish I could discover more films by that. Alas, Loden died before making another feature of yeah. Cancer. Yeah. Well, and yeah, it's it's really interesting too because I've always thought it'd be interesting to take and do the opposite of what Birth of a Nation did, and go back and actually show everything for what it was, but make that film like Birth of the Nation was made, and actually show that it's just kind of like the West. The meth, the West is just mythologized. Yeah, the Western, you know, people think it was all like, oh, we, the Indians were bad. It's like, no, we literally raped, pillaged, and killed. You know, that's what Manifest Destiny was, but we don't talk about that. We mythologize the Western, just yeah. like, you know, and I, I'm hoping and I'm hoping that we start to see more films that kind of get into that truth um, of what history was really like, especially with, um, whether they're, you know, we're starting to see a lot more female directors come in and starting to see some different films and that are tagging, trying to tackle those things. Well, um, especially if a film is some, it's not really a history book, and yet it's sure it's ingested as if by everyone, as if they were the best students in the world. And they, they, they kind of, you feel like these films still represent the world. Maybe not with historical facts, but with subtle, invisible ones, like the way, you know, just, um, I didn't, I, I sort of came to understand the way the world was in a weird way. And I was only partially right after spending a few decades watching Hollywood film, old Hollywood film. And I, I certainly never believed that, um, well, I'd heard of Jim Crow, and I didn't believe that African Americans were only butlers. Uh, like you see in these movies or escaped convicts or something like that, but they're basically just not even represented at all. And then, um, but that fact also meant something. I knew you couldn't show pregnant women. So I felt that maybe African-Americans were being omitted the way um, pregnant women were. I felt something was up and it, you could really feel the, um, that whites controlled it but all seemed safely in the past because by the time I was a kid there were all sorts of cool African-American actors thrilling me but they're still really underrepresented and that was the lie because I didn't realize how underrepresented they were I thought it was a problem that had been dealt with and was now okay everything was okay so, so it, there's really subtle messages that people just accept as as given so I'd already figured out even as a young child to reject as a good thing, the world as represented by old Hollywood, yeah. but the, it's the contemporary Hollywood that can be really sinister. Uh, so that's what's being addressed very actively now by very smart and sensitive readers of social justice and things like that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I like, I kind of hold film to literature standards mm -hmm. and literature really has an obligation. If you're gonna read a book, it, it better feel like the truth somehow and film has always been you know it's a business first and an art form but you want a good film to feel like it's telling you the truth in a way so um it's just got a ways to go now and 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 there's huge strides even in the last year um since the george floyd protests they're starting you know it can only happen so fast film moves kind of slowly yeah. because films take a long time in development and take a long time to shoot and edit, especially during a pandemic. But I think it'll be interesting what comes out in the next oh, yeah. Well, and we're still, you know, 
movies still are, a, you know, I've always thought there are two things. They're a way to get us information in a creative way. Cause some of, I like the films of the sixties. I always think of, I would watch in my film class at MSU when I was in college and I would walk out and I would be like really thinking about what I had watched. Whereas a lot of the more recent films that come out in the theaters, I don't find myself doing that as much. Um, and I always think about that. I'm like, we can still do things like that. And movies, you know, it's a fantasy as well, which is a good segue into, I, I have to ask about one of my favorites and that's a uh, nightmare. Hello. Demi. Demi. Aurora. Nightmare. Nightmare of Winnipeg. A Demi. Nihad Ademi is my father. He invented a kind of natural television which converted the music made by the Aurora Borealis into moving pictures. That was the film that actually inspired me when I was in quarantine to take a poem that I had written called Haunted and made it into a um, right. short film. And I just, it, there's just something about that, that film that just, I find very beautiful because it's the, you know, about him using the Aurora Borealis and, putting the projecting films and things on it just there's just something magical about it but it was just the fact that i was hearing him narrate the whole time and see it made it very personal and real to me yeah i used i wanted to use nihad ademi as the he's a bosnian refugee from the civil wars of the 90s and he sent like so many uh, refugees from that war that came to canada sent directly to winnipeg to freeze their asses off and uh he became a friend of mine at the local Bar Italia. Great voice, sort of like he out Bella's Bella Lugosi. And um, yeah. he's got a great profile. And he's just been through a lot. And I don't know, he has a way of sorting through what he's been through. And so he seemed like the perfect act, non actor to use. He looks great, but he's just got so much natural sadness in him. And that, that film was a commission from the National Film Board of Canada for its, to celebrate its 75th anniversary. But it always seems like what's typical in Canada, these great things that are set up by the state always get defunded later. <laughs> and so it just sort of seemed like, and I, I don't know, I just thought of the story almost like stream of consciousness. I just um, thought, I'll just have this guy who's figured out how to, with all the hope in his heart, figured out how to project or to use the Aurora Borealis to project things across the great distances that Canada's spread over and, um, and then just get shut down. I don't know. Um, I can't even remember. That's, it wasn't much of a celebration of the National Film Board. It was kind of like closing the National Film Board on, on a film they paid for or something like that. But um, I'm glad you like it. I barely remember making it. I also remember casting a bunch of characters in it that also appeared in a few other of my short films, Glorious, and uh, send, uh, send Me to the Electric Chair. I was planning on taking, I was getting a lot of short film commissions in those days. And I thought, what if I just stitched together about 10 short films into a feature? I'd all of a sudden have a feature. Um, and so I had written a very loose outline for a feature film, which eventually became Keyhole. But um, it was going to star Nihad Ademi and Isabella Rossellini and, and a few of the other people that appear in all three of those movies. Yeah. And I was just going to keep shooting shorts and then just cut them together somehow in a very elliptical, dreamy way. And I probably should have done that, actually, because Keyhole ended up disappointing me quite a bit. But, oh, really? uh, but I probably should have just tried this radical uh, Frankensteining approach to something about my childhood house. 
anyway well, thanks I, for your, I, your, I actually i actually just got, I, I bought keyhole the other day so i'm actually going to be watching it <laughs> probably this weekend but that there's just something i just i i just, I just absolutely love nightmare i it, there's just something beautiful about it to me i don't know what, it, what i can't really put my finger on it but it was just i just got lost in it so i love that film oh, thank and, you so much. Yeah, and, and it inspired me. I mean, I, as soon as I got done with that, I was like, I'm going to go make something because I'm I can't do much here in the house, but I can go make <laughs> make something here. Oh, your your film is lovely. The one the one that you made right after is it's really lovely. So thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me. There, there's another film and I had never watched it until you had sent it to me and that was Bring Me the Head of Tim Horton. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and I got some questions on that. Yeah. Uh, so there was one line you said and I remember you're walking up to the crew and it, I, I'm going to you know, totally screw up the line but it was something along the lines of I was trying to go to the crew to see if they would help me film this but many of them hated me. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. how much truth is there to that and why i used to think that everybody loved me but man the the moment you're disabused of that notion is one you don't forget and um and then maybe you start overcompensating and you start feeling everyone hates you i don't know the truth is somewhere between everybody and no one but i could feel i i I, I at least always made a, I was an extra once before I ever made a movie. I was an extra on, at a film with Ellen Burstyn in it, she shot in Winnipeg. It was so boring to shoot. It was so slow and tedious and everyone was rude to each other on that set. And I remember thinking if I ever make a movie, I'm gonna be polite and I'm gonna work really quickly. There'll be none of this waiting around for an hour between shots. I'm gonna, if I'm, I'm gonna shoot even whether I'm ready or not, you know, and so I, I followed through on that promise to myself and I tried to keep the sets fun and light and have and finish early and send people home early and as a result and and there was a lot of laughter on set all the time on all my movies and um so I I, I got overconfident that people liked me uh you know it's it's kind of like when you hear laughter that's a form of approval mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean people really like you that means they laughed that minute um, so I, I kind of got full of myself probably, and probably some people got sick of that, of a, a certain strut I might've had in my step or a smirk I needed wiped off my face, I don't know. And then I did chance upon a, a good friend of mine I'd hired to be the art director on Twilight of the Ice Nymphs. I went looking for him one day at lunch because I wanted to hang out with my friend and everybody was gone. And I finally looked, I, I kept looking behind piles of things in this massive warehouse space and I found him leading a mutiny of the entire crew of the film against me. <laughs> They'd had enough of me and didn't, didn't, and they were gonna quit the project. And to this day, I still don't understand exactly what I did wrong, but I did it. I did something wrong, that's for sure. And it's been a real lesson because I just got the silent treatment. No one ever explained to me what I did wrong, but they, they had had enough. And, and that was a lot of people. And so um, I'm just left not knowing. It's kind of like being um, on a social media in a way. You might get lots of likes, but what does that mean? It just means you're hooked on likes, uh, yeah. but it also means you've probably got a social media um, neuroses of some sort, it's like psychopathy. Yeah. Psych and so I think just- so were, they, so were those guys really that, like I, the guy threw a rock at you? In the film, I remember. Did he really do that? <laughs> that was that was just a staging. I okay, think. okay. I was I was like, man, that guy's a dick. <laughs> Almost all the acrimony in that movie was staged. The conceit of that movie. I met Paul Gross. It's a behind. For those of you who don't know, it's a behind the scenes film 
on the making of this Canadian war movie, an, Af an Afghanistan Canadian war movie uh, called Hyena Road. Paul Gross is the director and the star, and he's kind of Canada's most successful populist filmmaker. And I'm the artsiest and fartsiest, maybe. <laughs> or, and um, I needed money. And I heard that Paul was shooting in uh, Jordan for Afghanistan. And I thought, well, let's, let's, let's pitch this. We'll do a behind the scenes, but the conceit will be kind of like taking off on my Winnipeg, just make it very personal. The conceit will be, I hate Paul Gross. Um, I actually, Paul Gross is actually very funny and warm and generous. And, and he even financed the film. Um, but the idea was that he was really handsome and fit, which he is and successful and had a bigger budget, bigger budget by far than I did. And I had nothing and I had to grovel uh, just to make a behind the scenes movie. That was the conceit. And so we followed through on that while making the film and all that stuff was kind of fictional. And then it came true though, when, um, when, the, when we, we both finished our films, uh, he finished Hyena Road and it was ready to premiere at Toronto International Film Festival. And Tiff gave us a little installation uh, viewed in the lobby. All of a sudden, I think he was under a lot of pressure to deliver a re this really big hit movie. And so many critics in Canada were out to get him because they just, they were somehow was perceived that my film was out to get his film. And so critics took sides with me and really went out to get Paul. And uh, so Paul asked if the film could be not shown at TIFF, if it could be shown later. But TIFF is the only place really anyone's gonna watch a film like that. And so we started to argue. And um, then he wanted um, some shots removed, just one shot actually in, in particular that he felt was very disrespectful to the army. And I just thought, I don't wanna be censored. I remember Louis Manuel saying at the end of his life, well, at least no one has ever succeeded in getting me to remove a shot against my will. And I wanted to be able to die and say that, but I had to take out a shot that he felt was really disrespectful to the army. And I don't think it was at all, but, um, and so we started to um, fight and really genuinely bad feelings came out of this artificial uh, bad feeling that we oh, wow. was the movie. And um, I, I, um, we, uh, I, uh, yeah, really bad, really bad threats and things were said. I eventually wrote an email apology, but I don't think it was good enough. You know, apologies have to be 100% pure or they're 100% crap. Uh, so he didn't accept the apology. And I'm hoping someday I can reword that apology, really burnish it up and, and, and um, make amends to him. I, I truly am sorry that, um, you know, he funded my movie and it exists because of his generosity, but um, but I you know I guess I didn't mean I didn't intend to bite the hand that fed me, but I I sure ended up doing so. Finally, it was someone's idea of a funny joke to cast me as a slain Taliban soldier in the deepest deepest background of some glorious Canadian raking of an Afghan village. Look at me, a director who has stood on stages at all the great film festivals in the world instructed by the first AD to remain still at the margins of this big budget frame. Dead, inert, impotent. I might as well be garbage flapping in the wind. I think, I think my favorite shot in it is with the little green screen behind you as you're walking, because you hadn't shot. I, I, I laughed so hard at that because it was, uh, you were almost being honest about it because you were like, I had never used green screen before because I'm always doing stuff old school. and. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like you were making fun of yourself in a way. And I thought that was just the idea that green screens had to be so big. I thought maybe if you just, if you just, if they're just slightly bigger than a bread box, you could just pop them in behind people's heads and get whatever, but they, uh, they tend not to fit. But I like the idea of flying all the way to Jordan. It takes about 36 hours to get there. You know, you go, you take three very long flights and then, and then a limousine through a desert and then a camel to the chute. And then you get there and you pull out this tiny little board and ask the art department for some green paint and paint it green and then just start plugging in shots of Winnipeg 
in behind. <laughs> um, I, I just love the exhausting self-cancellation of that little miracle. And let's move to your mo your two most recent films. Stunt the Guesser. It was a unique film to me. I loved it. But it was the first time I'd seen you guys actually use animations in some of the stuff in instead of old schools. Yeah. Film tricks. What was your what was was it that was there a reasoning behind that? Or I think it was also a commission from the ensemble music fabric, this really mischievous orchestra out of uh, Cologne, Germany. And they really want, we had sort of after the Forbidden Room vowed we wouldn't return to silent movies again, that we'd pretty much done and said everything we could with it. But they clearly wanted a silent movie that they could play various mm -hmm. composers work to, sort of in their own a musical version of the Kuleshev effect. They would play the movie uh, multiple times, but with a different uh, score each time live and uh, so it was, it was a fun experiment but so we went back to the forbidden room style of silent filmmaking it's purely digital and we just didn't it was shot on short notice and we didn't have any sets at all mm -hmm. and so that movie is entirely composited by Galen and Evan I think mostly Evan yeah uh, uh, of just individual actors, even for the crowd scenes, individual actors just shot against green screen. Really? In the I, didn't, I didn't notice that, so good job on that. <laughs> that was really... Uh, no, they really honed their compositing chops on that movie and have decided to hate green screen. You know, so next time we need uh, fake backgrounds, we want to use that LED screen, a rear screen projection that's really good. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I noticed too, you didn't do as many intertitles, but you had like, sometimes when they, he would speak, you would actually have the yeah the words there. Was that just, just to be different or was it there was something with that choice? Was, I'd seen a number of silent movies that did that. So it was definitely not a precedent setter, but I, I guess it was out of concern. The ensemble music fabric would have images, not just text on screen to play their music to. So we wanted the words to come out on the same on the same frame as the actual speaking face or yeah. saying that. that's what you mean. Um, so I think that was often used. And I don't know. And then we watched a lot of Popeye cartoons and we thought maybe that's where the animation comes in. We liked the way the Fleischer brothers got everyone in the Popeye cartoon to sort of bounce rhythmically. Awesome. Uh -huh. Now, it's really hard to get real actors to do that without them looking stupid and feeling horrible. So, but we could at least give the backgrounds at the beginning and the end of the movie, something like that. Well, well where did the story for Stump the Guesser come from? Because, I mean, it's um, it's a very unique, um, let's see here, I have it written down here. Yes, um, Stump the Guesser, uh, he works as a at the fairgrounds as Stump the Guesser who can guess anything for a fee. But suddenly yeah. his trick, his trick stopped working. Where did the what was it the memory milk or whatever it was called? I forget. Was it memory milk? Uh, memory milk, I think it is. Yeah, Monica, I can't remember exactly. I think it's memory milk. Yeah, that's if you're if your guessing mojo is starting to waft away, you just go up and down a few mouthfuls of memory milk and it'll come back. Um, the commission actually attached an artist to pay tribute to. We were told to make a film tribute to this Soviet absurdist named Daniel Harms. Um, he wrote a lot of children's books, but he also wrote adult absurdism, very short fragments, and they're very violent and very absurd. Often a short story would be an old lady sits on a windowsill, she falls to her death, the end, you know, <laughs> something like that. So we tried to harness a lot of the things that thread their way through out that guy's tragically short career. He died, no one knows exactly what he died from. He had an illness, a very bad illness, but he also starved to death 
during the siege of Leningrad, and maybe he was shot as well. So anyway, Daniil Harms, for all his blithe, absurdist violence, is a really dark and tragic figure. So we just wanted a mixture of that kind of weird, bouncy absurdism and something really dark underneath it. So we sort of knew the flavor that we it was, had. It's definitely entertaining. I also like that big, was it the big wheel that he would always spin? Right. Uh, yeah, so was that one of the only set pieces that you were able to create? Uh, that is just a miniature that's about eight inches in diameter and it's just, we shot separately and just composited in. There were, there were no sets. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. That's why I wanted to ask. That's really neat, though, because I thought it looked great. Um, yeah, and it was a good experiment. We decided at least, well, we worked hard on the script, actually. It, we really wanted it to be, I, I think Evan, who doesn't have a sister, is especially erotically charged by the idea of someone um, marrying his sister. So we got that in there safely without Evan hurting anybody. And then... Um, and and also Daniil Harms has absurdist um, transgressions like that all the time. Yeah. And so it seemed like I don't know. They're just it's a light sprinkling of tributes to Daniil Harms, framed, stitched together into a narrative, and then um, and then just that just get a little more intense toward the end. And then basically the protagonist. Um, um, played by a, a fellow filmmaker from Winnipeg, Adam Brooks. He's a really good filmmaker and a good actor. And I was really thrilled to be able to work with him on recent short films. Um, he's the guesser, the day guest, or the night guesser. There's a day guesser that I really like too. Yeah. Uh, that guy is an amazing voice actor, but he's acting in a silent film. Uh, anyway, I'll be working with him in the future. Um, it's... Um, He's, he's the voice, he's a voice actor, the, the day guesser. He's a voice actor whose current job is to announce the daily uh, COVID uh, uh, totals and, oh <laughs> and press conference. So I get to hear this amazing voice that I hope to hire to use in a film every day when I'm listening to my noon COVID results. Anyway, yeah. um, uh, it was, it was a great chance to work with new people and really scoured Winnipeg for proper faces. And I think the extras are really good in the movie. So I was getting, I was kind of scolding myself for not digging down deeper and working harder to find good extras in earlier films. And we really proved to ourselves ourselves that they're here. And, and then, um, Evan and Galen wanted to work on their compositing and we wanted to, I don't know. So it was kind of um, an assignment in a way that not only is, you know, is it what it is as a film to watch, but it was, it was like going to film school for a, you know, yeah. half a year. So it's just basically all the stuff that you guys, like it just kind of all melded together quite well. Right. And now we're ready to make a feature film involving compositing and LED screens and lots yeah. of great ideas. And, that's cool. Well, then your most recent one too, besides that, is the Rabbit Hunters. So, um, explain. You know, I'll, I'll let you explain that one because that one yeah. you guys were commissioned to do as yeah. well. That one was really low budget because one it was four thousand dollars, which I've made features for four thousand dollars, but I had to make it in a hurry because it was a commission from the Pacific Film Archive um, in Berkeley. Uh, the Berkeley Art Museum, the BAMPFA, the B-A-M-P-F-A. -A. Um, they were throwing a big Federico Fellini centennial party. Mm -hmm. And they suddenly realized, like his birthday was already coming in a few days in late January. And they wanted something for this big party they were uh, throwing in very early April. And so we had to hustle. So we had to hire some people. So otherwise we would have just done it ourselves. But mm -hmm. you need you need to spend four thousand dollars on a on a studio space in the middle of winter when it's 35 below in Winnipeg. And so we had it did cost us four thousand dollars to get costumes. And although the best um, the best costumes in the movie are probably supplied by the drag queens we hired just to, who brought their own costume um, to act in the film. Yeah. 
you know, as Fellini-esque subjects. Anyway, the film was an attempt. Fellini had um, written his entire life a dream diary, and we thought the best way to make a tribute to him was to shoot some excerpts from his dream diary. But it turns out his dream diary is copyrighted, and we didn't have time to clear it with a lawyer yeah. or the money. So we, um, luckily, Evan and I also keep dream diaries, and we just shot our own dream diaries. It turns out Fellini, who's from Rimini, Italy, which is the Winnipeg of Italy, I'm told. Um, turns out Evan and Fellini and I all have similar dreams. So it was very easy, you know, anxiety dreams about missing planes, and, uh, worried yeah. about one's health and stuff. So we were just able to take our own dreams and assign them to a character that's unnamed. It's, it's not, Fellini's name is never ever mentioned, but it's Isabella Rossellini mm -hmm. playing a Fellini character. And, um, and, and then she's, she's sort of playing both Fellini and his wife, Gilletta Messina. She's sort of a non-binary character that's both mm -hmm. husband and, and, um, and then because I had to shoot without Isabella here in Winnipeg, I just got a friend of mine, Gilly Bear, to play a male body double for Isabella. And then I flew to San Francisco and used some green screen and Gail and Evan and I shot her against green screen there and they composited her into the movie. So it's, it's an international co-pro uh, shot uh, in San Francisco and Winnipeg in the dead of winter and, um, and then just sutured together. And, um, and it's just some dreams and it's kind of pleasant. We discovered some more uh, local actors that we really love. There's an Italian gentleman that looks kind of like the Italian writer, Gabriella D'Annunzio and uh, we really want to use him in the future. Um, so um, it's just a little dream and it was fun working with Isabella again. Um, it's always nice to get affirmation from her that she likes what we're doing uh, because I respect her so much. She's such a talented comedian and writer mm -hmm. and no one thinks of her in those terms, but well, more and more people think of her in those terms because she's great, but it's, it's really nice to be, uh, her opinion matters a lot to me. What does the future hold for you and any future stories or projects? I don't know. Um, we've taken the, oh, by the way, the rabbit hunters uh, never did air because the pandemic hit just the day it was to premiere. And so the screening was canceled. Oh, man. And, um, well, it's it, we're, we're showing it as part of this event online. So everybody yeah. gets to see it. So I'm excited about that. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, the future, I don't know, we spent the pandemic writing a lot. So we've got three projects written and ready to go. And they're just now we're just trying to raise money for them. And we're getting some purchase on a little bit of what's traction. That's the word, traction. We're getting traction. <laughs> some of this stuff. So we'll see. Sometimes I just feel like rolling over and dying. And other times I really, I'm really game to these new movies. Now. So we'll see. Well, I want to see a new project sometime soon. I, you know, um, I, if your name's attached to it, I'll watch it. Um, okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, you know, your work continues to inspire me. And I, if I know if it's inspiring me, it's inspiring others. I just know that ever it has to, it just has to, I don't understand why. It, well, there's a few people that have been kind enough. It's, it's true. There's, there's some people they are really spread maybe a bit thin around the globe for my liking, but, uh, you know, I got to just keep working hard. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. And of course, I hope that somehow the SARS world will align and I'll be able to do something with you somewhere down the line, no, in some way, shape or form and creatively as well. But, you know, um, thank you so much for being part of the first EF yeah. Talks event. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Um, and um I hope that we can do more of this down the line. It's a great idea for an event, and um, and let's just stay in touch. Never Absolutely. know what happens. Okay, thanks so much, Jason. Take care. Yeah. Thank you.